So I am very honored to be here. So thank you very much for this invitation. So I will kind of continue with the journey that the previous keynote was presenting. And I will be talking about these micro architectural attacks he was mentioning, these hardware vulnerabilities, that they are also called transient execution attacks. So let me start my presentation with this slide. Don't worry, you don't need to read this slide. You don't need to understand anything here. I'm just showing you this because this code belongs to a very famous cryptographic library called Libsodium. And this here is an encryption function, an encryption function that has been formally verified to a property called constant time. So this property essentially means that this cryptographic function here does not leak the cryptographic key to the attacker. But guess what? This function that was formally verified leaks the cryptographic key to the attacker. And this is due to Spectre, these hardware vulnerabilities that were discovered in early January uh, 18th. So these hardware vulnerabilities came as a very much as a surprise to everybody. The hardware industry became crazy because almost every computer system was affected by these vulnerabilities here. So, so much they affected everything that, as the previous keynote already mentioned, all the security defenses we had before became almost invalidated. And they opened a new era in security. This is called now the Spectre era. So today I will explain to you what is Spectre a bit more in detail than in the previous keynote. And for that, I will explain first what is a constant time. Actually, to explain constant time, I need to explain to you the idea of what is a cache side channel attack. So let's get started by cache side channel attacks. See, there are two very simple line of codes. Uh, here, this simple line of codes, they might appear in cryptographic code, for example. It's very common. You can see on the bottom of my slide some memory layout that contains uh, a secret key part and a table part, which are two arrays on the memory. OK, so the code is really very simple. On the first line, it accesses the secret key. And then what it is uh, there, it will uh, be used to access the second array, the array table. And if, even if it is not obvious with these two lines of code, just to access this to, to the memory, this code leaks the secret key to the attacker. And this is due to cache attacks. Let me explain. Every time code accesses the memory, actually, the thing, the data that is in the memory, is going to be moved to a fast memory called the cache, which is in the, in the processors. So once uh, this data is moved to the cache, the second time that the program is accessing the same data, the access will be faster. And precisely that point is used by an attacker to understand what accesses have been used by, for example, the cryptographic code. And in this way, the attacker can prove the memory and try to understand which parts have been accessed or not. And in this way, if some secret is in the address part of the cache, then the attacker can recover this secret via cache attacks, OK? So good, these attacks, cache attacks, they had existed for some time now, and we know how to defend. So the way to defend against these attacks is called constant time programming. And this is very simple set of rules. Actually, we have two rules, secrets in programs, for example, cryptographic libraries in particular, should not influence the control flow of a program, or secrets should not influence memory accesses. In particular, secrets cannot be used as array indices. And these two rules, constant time rules, 
were using cryptographic libraries and we thought everything was okay until 2018. And this is when we realized that these constant time programming rules failed to account on how modern processors actually compute and process instructions. And this has to do with spectral attacks. Let me, let me first tell you roughly how processors actually process instructions. So when you see a program here on the slide, you can see three lines of code. You usually think that the processor will first execute the first instruction, then the second instruction, and follow the control flow of the program as you see it. But this is not how processors actually work. The way in which they work is they have different areas. You can see here, and each of the areas is going, the, each instruction is going to go through all these areas in order to be executed. So for example, for the first instruction, the load, which will access the memory, it will go to the area called fetch, and then in the time two of the processing, it will go to the area called decode. But now you can see that the fetch area of the processor has been uh, freed, so the second instruction immediately is going to be taken to that area. Why? Because now we have uh, the possibility to process two instructions in parallel, and that is essentially faster. This is called the pipeline. So now we want to continue with this pipeline, but you can see here that you have uh, an instruction which is branching according to a condition. So if this condition here, RV less than four, is true, we should uh, fetch instruction three, and if it is false, we should fetch instruction five. However, you can see also that this condition depends on RV, which, has, uh, which is being computed on instruction one. And we don't know the result of RV yet. So there are two options at this point. We can stall the pipeline. The processor can stall the pipeline, and everything will be um, delayed. Or a more efficient uh, way to do things which is predict what is going to be the result of the condition. So if the condition, for example, uh, is uh, RV is predicted to be less than four, then we'll go directly and fetch instruction three. And this is based, of course, in uh, some algorithms that are encoded in the, in the processor and in particular branch predictors for, for these uh, branching instructions in such a way that the pipeline won't get stored and we can continue execution by using this guess. And this is called speculative execution because it's based on a prediction. It is just speculation. So like this, we can just continue the execution on the pipeline and you can see everything is very fast and it doesn't have uh, any delays. So now wh what happens if the prediction was wrong? So if this condition actually was not true and the prediction was wrong, not a problem. So processors, the only thing that they will do is they will roll back all this speculative execution which was wrong. And these speculations that were there in the pipeline for some time, these transient speculations, will be just rolled back and removed from the pipeline. And all of this has existed for many years now, and it's completely transparent for the programmer. The programmer doesn't even know about the existing of all these things that are in hardware. But there is a detail that after all this rollback, which is transparent for the programmer, we still have that the cache state, this fast memory that I taught you before, is not reset. So everything is rolled back, but not the cache. And here we are in the situation where I can already explain to you what is Spectre attack. This is these three lines of code that you're seeing on the slide, this is the first Spectre attack that existed. 
Spectre V1. So let me show you how this call, now that we have more details on the hardware, how this actually executes and produces an attack. So here you have, at the first instruction, a branch that, according to a condition, RA um, less than 4 will speculatively go to the second instruction. This instruction, the second instruction, is an access to memory. And this access to memory is on the address 40 plus RA. You can see that the memory is here, the memory layout is here. You have public A, public B, and a secret key, which is a secret part of a memory. So 40 uh, plus RA, here you see RA is 9, is 49. And this uh, is part of the secret key, and this address is going to the cache. But so far, there is no problem, because these cache attacks can only deduce what is in the address of the cache, and there is no secret so far on the cache. So that's not the problem in itself. It's so far, so good. The problem comes on the third instruction, where we do the second memory access. Because now, speculatively, again, we are executing an access to the memory, which is 44 plus RV. And RV has a secret now. This secret comes from the secret key. And at that point, this address with the secret goes to cache and, well, cache attacks, you know. The attacker can recover secrets from the cache. So game over, the attacker, by repeating this process, can recover the whole secret key. And this is bad, <laughs> because it has, as I told you before, changed completely the way we look at security today. So I had so far brought brought you up to speak with this first ve uh, version of Spectre, Spectre V1. The, let me tell you very quickly what are uh, different variants that have appeared since uh, the occurrence of this first Spectre V1 in 2018 and some open challenges in the area. Okay, 2018 Spectre V1, but that was not the end of the story. Every year since 2018, we have, seen, we have seen in the top conferences of security a new attack appearing, a new attack that is possible thanks to speculative execution. So not only we have more versions of Spectre now, but we also have a family of Spectre attacks. And not only we have a family of Spectre attacks, we also have families of different kinds of attacks that rely on different parts of the hardware, not only the cache. So we have the family of Meltdown, the, ha the family of LVI, that the previous keynote was mentioning this breaks completely SGX, SGX trusted models. Well, LIV, Pac-Man-like attacks, well, a series of attacks. So the question here is, which are, uh, if we zoom in one of these families, the defenses? Because of course, this was, uh, these kind of attacks are very dangerous because they can go through every barrier that we have in software and in hardware. So of course, people have been working a lot on defenses, both on the software side and on the hardware side. So for each attack that has been occurring, there has been a defense that came right afterwards. So you can see, for example, these are very uh, widely used defenses. Just to tell you an example, this index masking here is one of the defenses that is used in the Safari browser, which is the main browser in Mac computers. So they have implemented this software defense to protect, protect browsers from this uh, Spectre BHT attacks to which uh, Spectre V1 belongs. But the real question actually is not if there are defenses. The question is, do these defenses work? That's the real question. So very quickly, just a glimpse to the slide here. The red uh, defenses here are the ones that have been broken already. 
So all these red defenses had been broken, so they don't work. And we are still on a moment where we are just waiting for the next uh, broken defense uh, to, to be destroyed by in the next attack. So transient execution attacks are here, and they are not a solved problem yet. So which are the open challenges in this area? So of course, there are challenges in the area of attacks and defenses in this new specter era. For example, the paper you can see on the slide over there is a paper that resuscitated an old attack that existed, it's called reuse attacks, thanks to speculative execution. So a defense that was there to prevent some attacks, now it is shown, this paper showed, that it doesn't work anymore because you can just bypass the defense via speculative execution. And this was not even the last paper that show these kind of things, like all attack. Uh, for example, this other also bypasses pointer uh, authentication. These um, attacks have the potential to resuscitate all attacks that were sought to be solved. So we have work to do in the attack landscape. How many, we have to understand, how many old attacks can become new in the Spectre era. We don't know that yet. And as for defenses, we need more robust defenses, defenses that can resist to new attacks. And of course, formal methods can give you something there. And there are some formal models in that area. But one of the problems we're facing is that we, it's not easy to validate these formal models against the hardware. For example, some work here in Sweden has been already uh, uh, occurred regarding um, the validation of formal models against hardware. But this is not an easy task because some of the microarchitectural details in the hardware, they are secret. Uh, and, and they are owned by these in industrial companies, okay? So we, it's not easy to validate formal models. So how can we provide more robust defenses is one of the open questions. But perhaps the most important of all the challenges is uh, this one that is on my slide now. So far, since 2018, we have been uh, seen, we have seen the occurrence of one attack, and with one attack, the attacker uh, provides an attack, there has been a reaction, which is we provide the defense. Then the defense is broken, there is also a new attack, there, there is again a defense occurring. We are always reacting. But if we want to stop with this cycle, we need to go one step ahead of the attacker and start to think about what is going to be the future of hardware. Already in the first paper of Spectre, they were talking about future processors, future hardware, and new techniques. And there has been some steps into this um, direction, like how do we build the new hardware? How do we absolutely change the hardware of today in order to, for sure, protect against these attacks? But OK, this is still an open challenge. And the question is, what new hardware do we actually need to prevent these attacks and come back to the place we were before 2018? So thanks uh, for, for your attention. This is just a wrap up, which summarizes the state of security today. And yeah, thanks. And I'm expecting some questions. Thank you for a really engaging talk. And engaging and scary. Um, there was a question to Professor Sadeghi about side channel attacks, but I think you've addressed them. Another question from um, our audience is, of course, what are the steps that an organization can take to present, uh, pr um, protect themselves from transient attacks? 
Well, I suppose that um, for an for industry, the way to go is just follow these widely used defenses. Although some of them they are broken, I think the best uh, an industry can do is just use them. Um, the Although they're broken. Yes, because there are no other options. Like for now, it's really bad, mm -hmm. the situation. And then for research, of course, we need to go and find more defenses that will actually work. And there, there is a lot of people working on that. On a scale one to five, where five is really worried, how worried are you um, that the hardware cannot keep up with the uh, sort of ingenuity of the attackers? Uh... Well, I will say that uh, current hardware cannot keep up. <laughs> so I'm not worried because I already know this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you've given up there. <laughs> but I, I, that's why I think we need new hardware. Mm. We, we don't have to patch all hardware. Another question is, how is AI changing the nature of transient attacks? Ooh. So I don't think so far AI has had an influence on the, the attacks. I suppose that given that today we really have a data set of attacks of this kind, we could build a, an AI to find new attacks. But AI will not help us with defenses or with building new hardware, that's for sure. Why? Because um, AI are trained to evolve on things that they can train on. And these things are new even for us, for researchers. So that's why AI cannot help. Oh, OK. Um, if you had unlimited um, number of hours, what would you um, devote your time on uh, in terms of research? Hardware. Hardware research. We need, uh, what I believe is that we don't have all the expertise in cybersecurity today. We need to interact with people who is working on computer architectures with hardware industry when they are Companies open. like NVIDIA and so on. Companies, yeah, like ARM, Intel, maybe the main processor companies. Um, but also with researchers which are working on microarchitectures, not on the security side, but just microarchitecture as design. And um, this is a way to go forward. We need to collaborate and think on new hardware. That was a very clear message. Thank you, um, Professor um, Tamara Resk, for, for being here today um, and for providing clarity. Thank you.